Hello, my name is Oliver Carasoni, and today I will be discussing in situ stress measurement and comparing the results of two methods used at Kirkland Lake Gold's Macasa mine. Macasa is one of seven major mines and currently the only active operation on the Kirkland Lake ore body, an orogenic greenstone gold deposit in northeastern Ontario, Canada. The Kirkland Lake ore body has been exploited for over 100 years and mining reached a depth of 8,000 feet at some operations. With increased depth comes increased in situ and induced stresses, and the Kirkland Lake mines were among the first in Canada to experience rock bursts. The most pervasive issues with rock bursting in Kirkland Lake were linked to overstressed pillars. The figures on this slide show examples from case studies on rock bursts at Macassa. Pillar bursts have been triggered by de-stress blasting, cut and fill mining, and open stope mining. They have occurred locally and on larger scales and have affected both stopes and the infrastructure near them. We rely on our ability to estimate pillar stability and mitigate risks by making strategic and tactical changes to our designs. To guide these decisions, we do a lot of our own boundary element modeling with a focus on calibrating pillar strengths and rock mass response. A fundamental input to numerical models is a stress tensor, the direction and magnitude of the principal stresses and how they vary with depth. To establish the local stress tensor, Macassa participated in a program with CANMET, which was performing overcoring measurements at several mines in Ontario and Quebec in the 1980s. The measurements at Macassa were taken during the development of number three shaft, which was to reach a depth of 7,000 feet. The future shaft location was already accessible from 5,300 and 6,300 mine levels, which was where the measurements were taken. These locations were as far as possible from the extracted areas to avoid the influence of mining induced stresses on the results. Overcoring is a strain recovery method. Strain gauges are glued into a pilot hole in the rock, which is then overcored using a larger diamond drill bit. As the gauges are overcored, the relaxation of the rock is recorded as it relaxes from its in situ compressed state to its unstressed state. Once the sample is recovered, it is compressed in a laboratory to determine its Young's modulus and Poisson's ratio. Those values are then used to convert the relaxation strains back to in situ stresses. It is a detailed test, but one that is difficult to perform well. The gauges should be installed in a smooth hole located in unbroken ground. The gauges have to be well adhered to the rock. The overcoring must remain aligned with the pilot hole, and the intact sample has to be recovered, which is all easier said than done with a six inch diameter piece of rock at the end of a 10 meter hole. Ultimately, six results were obtained from the overcoring program with three on each level. When we look at the measurements from each level, we see a lot of scatter in the principal stress orientations on 5300. The bearings of the major stress vary by over 40 degrees compared to around 20 degrees on the 6300 level. The average results from 5300 also produce a more northerly trend to the major stress compared to a more northeasterly trend on 6300. The most obvious explanation for the high variance and different average bearing on 5300 is that the test location was close to the 04 break, which is a major fault and ore associated structure in the Kirkland Lake ore body. The presence and growth of faults can distort the local stress tensor, so we are not necessarily getting consistent measurements near them and faults are abundant in the Kirkland Lake ore body. So therein lies the challenge with overcoring measurements. They are difficult to obtain and only represent a point measurement which we have to assume can be extrapolated to a larger scale. In 2020, most of our production comes from an area called the South Mine Complex, or SMC. The SMC is a family of connecting structures between the O4 break and the amalgamated break, another ore related structure to the south. The elevation of current mining in the SMC is between 5,000 and 5,800 feet deep, so similar to the depths of the overcoring measurements, but it is over 5,000 feet to the southeast of them. We felt that we were reaching the limit of accurately extrapolating our point measurements of in situ stress. Also, we have to keep in mind that faults may change the stress tensor because they are a weakness that limits stress. Faults are the reason there is gold in Kirkland Lake. There are several major structures that host ore and younger structures that offset those. This slide shows just some of the major structures in the camp, but there are many more which have been mapped. So we have a structurally complex environment that is naturally prone to having a variable stress tensor. When we talk about stress field variations related to faults, I like to refer to the figure in the upper left as a visualization. The figure shows stress tensors and a model that simulated fracture growth. 
What we see is a lot of rotation and changes in magnitude both near the structures and farther away from them. So we ask ourselves, what if the Kirkland Lake Camp is in some way like this model but on a larger scale? Not necessarily the same mechanism of faulting, geometry, or magnitude of variations, but a system where the growth of large fractures significantly modify the local stress fields. The possibility of this scenario implies we should avoid extrapolating point measurements of stress over large areas and give some attention to the local stress tensor around new mining zones. We needed to do some work to validate the assumed stress tensor in the SMC. The justification for the stress measurement program was that we believe there could be large-scale variations in the stress tensor. So we wanted a methodology that would help us efficiently collect data over a large area. The two methods we looked at were borehole breakouts and acoustic emissions. The borehole breakout approach involves surveying diamond drill holes for breakouts which occur at 90 degrees to the major stress relative to that hole. The acoustic emission method involves recording what are effectively tiny seismic events emitted by a core sample as it is compressed and looking for an inflection point in the event rate that indicates the sample is being loaded beyond its previous maximum stress. We went with the borehole breakout approach because we felt it was better suited to determining stress orientation and detecting changes in orientation related to major structures. This approach comes at the cost of not knowing the stress magnitudes as well as the acoustic emission approach, but we decided we can do more measurement or calibration later if required. Here are some pictures of the data collection process. We worked in two diamond drill bays on the 5300 level, so the data is from a similar depth as the overcoring measurements. The upper left is the acoustic televiewer or ATV probe with the centralizers we use to survey the BQ size holes. On the upper right is the winch and data acquisition system. We used a single winch setup because all the holes were steeper than 40 degrees so we could rely on gravity to pull the probe to the end of the hole. Not surveying flat holes leaves a bit of uncertainty in the results, but we surveyed enough orientations that we got something reasonable. The first setup we did was in an active diamond drill bay. The drill was shut down, but we still had to work around it. The ATV probe is about 5 feet long and rigid, so we couldn't fit it into all those holes you see on the bottom left. We ended up having to move the drill so we could get more hole orientations. There are also often lots of hole orientations in a drill bay, but not a lot you can actively see. Holes in the floor quickly get covered in water or blocked with cuttings. The picture on the bottom right shows where we checked beneath the floorboards and dug around for some holes in different orientations. The picture on the top left shows a convenient setup of many different hole orientations. In this case, it was a matter of picking which orientations we wanted and finding holes that were not blocked. The bottom left shows an example of the collected and processed data. We get unrolled sections of the hole shape and reflectivity, which lets us see breakouts, which show up as rough sections on opposite sides of the borehole, and structures, which show up as sinusoids on the unrolled section. We compared some of the collected data to pictures of the drill core and found it interesting that we did not always see the same structural features or signs of stress like disking. The core in the picture on the bottom right was taken from a section of a hole with a lot of breakouts, but we don't see any signs of stress from disking in the core. Overall, we were able to survey 17 holes in a variety of orientations. The staring net in the upper right shows the hole orientations with tails to indicate the average breakout azimuth. You can see there is somewhat of a pattern to the breakout azimuths. This pattern gets fit to a theoretical stress tensor using our initial guess of the principal stress orientations. Several models were run to fit the data. The first model simply used all the available data and produced a stress tensor that was quite surprising to us. The major stress was oriented east-northeast instead of north-northeast. There are a few holes with misfit data and different combinations of them were excluded from subsequent models. The three other models produced were fairly consistent with each other, but still showed a result that was much different than we expected based on the overcoring tests. Each of the models had an uncertainty analysis that showed how well constrained the solution was. The uncertainty is shown as sort of a heat map of possible principal stress orientations. There is more uncertainty in the sigma 2 and 3 orientations because we did not survey any flat holes which are used to constrain the plunge of sigma 3. Based on other observations, we are fairly confident that sigma 3 is close to vertical which would make sigma 2 close to horizontal, and the orientation of sigma 1 was very well constrained. We compared the overcoring results from 6300 to the borehole breakout heat map expecting that the overcoring results would be only slightly off. 
However, what we see is that the overcurrent results were firmly outside the plausible orientations identified in the borehole breakout study. Being a small statistical outlier was now less of a possibility, so we had to go looking for other explanations for the differences. We looked at how much the breakout angle changed from one section to the next along the same hole. The holes didn't deviate by more than a few degrees, so there should be little change in the breakout angle along the entire length of a hole. However, what we see is that over the length of a hole, the breakout angle can wiggle back and forth or slowly rotate in a constant direction. A change in breakout angle could indicate that the stress field is rotating or a weakness in the rock is influencing the breakout angle. It is also possible that there is a small difference between the principal stresses which would lower the preference for a breakout to occur in a consistent orientation. This graph shows a cumulative distribution of the change in breakout angle from one section to the next. Some holes had a distinctly greater variance than others. We called less than 10 degrees low variance, less than 30 degrees moderate variance, and greater than 30 degrees high variance based on how much an uncertainty and stress orientation might affect a numerical model's results. It is interesting to think about if these variations represent the uncertainty you might get from a point measurement. There's a decent chance of getting good results, but a not insignificant chance that your point measurement could be very wrong, like over 45 degrees off. If we compare the change in breakout angles to the spread in the overcoring results, we see that the results are not too unreasonable. The 6300 results had moderate variance, and the 5300 results, which were near a major structure, had high variance. When we compare the difference between the overcoring and breakout average results, we find that the overcoring results may have been a bit off, but are still close enough to be considered accurate. One of the other factors we considered was that the breakout results could have been influenced by large-scale mining-induced stresses. We believe that there is minimal induced stresses a couple thousand feet into the hanging wall of the O4 break where the SMC is located. And we tried to survey far enough away from the SMC along strikes that the results would not be affected. But we see a bit of its influence on the results. This slide shows the theoretical breakout azimuths based on the stress inversion results versus the actual breakout azimuths observed in each hole in the model. We have three holes in this model that still show much larger residual error than the others. Hole 5 was drilled towards the lower abutment of the SMC stopes, and hole 9 was drilled towards the eastern abutment of the SMC stopes. Lastly, hole 1 was a misfit, but was far away from any stopes, so we do not expect an induced stress influence. Hole 3 was nearby and showed good fit with the theoretical results, so we suspect some natural structural influence on hole 1. We ran a mine scale boundary element model to check the influence of induced stresses on the surveyed holes. The model used the stress tensor obtained from overcore on the 6300 level to check if there is an induced rotation on it. This slide shows planned views of induced major and minor stresses at the 5600 level and the locations of the surveyed holes. We saw very small induced stress influences at the hole locations, mostly less than 1 MPA, but around 2 MPA on hole 5, which is one of the holes we suspect was affected by the induced stresses. There were also no obvious signs of rotation of the stress field near most of the hole locations. Different types of modeling may show little more influence, but we are confident that we avoided any significant influences from the mined out sections of the ore body. Looking more closely at major structures around the surveyed holes, we could see the influence they may have had on the results. In this slide, I'm showing section views of the two surveying locations. The numbers at the toe of the holes indicate the hole number, and in brackets is the median change in breakout angle from one section to the next in that hole. The first thing we notice is that the holes in location 1 have a lot more variance than the ones in location 2. Location 1 was sort of boxed in by the amalgamated break, a shallow branch of the SMC, and two post or cross faults. So Location 1 was a fairly structurally complex area where we would expect to have difficulty getting consistent stress measurements. Hole 5 is also shown going through the lower abutment of the SMC. We suspect some induced stress influences on this hole, but it also passes through a lot of the structures that make up the lower branch of the SMC, as well as the Q fault, which is a known source of false slip seismicity. Unfortunately, we only had time to survey the bottom half of this hole, so we only have data on one side of the Q fault. But the high variance and breakout orientation suggests some kind of structural influence. Location 2 had much lower variance and breakout orientations, except when we drilled south towards the amalgamated break. Most of the holes drilled north towards the SMC had low variance even though they passed through multiple structures, but holes 8 and 16 had distinctly higher variance. 
It seems like the further to the south we drill, the more inconsistent our results get. This result makes us suspect that the amalgamated break causes some inconsistency in the stress tensor, or the rock mass near it has some weakness angle that affects the breakout orientations. On this slide, we are looking at core photos from major structure zones in holes 8 and 16. Hole 16 passed through a major structure zone around 480 feet and then 640 feet. There is a lot of broken core, shearing, and veining. The presence of all these structures makes it plausible that there could be natural distortion in the stress field. On the other hand, the structures seem to intersect the hole at a low angle, which might create larger areas of weakness in the drill hole walls. Perhaps the variance in breakout orientation comes from biases in anisotropic strength rather than rotation in the stress field. In hole 8, we do not see as much broken core, which makes sense because there were about half as many structures picked up by the ATV as there were in hole 16. These holes are fairly close together, and hole 8 didn't intersect the amalgamated break, but came close. It could be that hole 8 wasn't close enough to the amalgamated break to intersect all the densely jointed ground. Both these holes agree with the modeled stress tensor quite well, despite all the variance. But in the future, we are going to try and survey towards the amalgamated break at different angles to see if we get different results. We also made plots of the ATV data along the length of the hole and paired that with our geology logging information. On this graph, we have two angle measurements, one for the high side and low side breakout angles at 180 degrees to each other. The number of structures identified by the ATV per 10 feet, larger structures identified by the ATV as F1 and F2, lithology contacts, and structures such as veins, faults, shears, and breaches logged by our geologists. We wanted to see where the breakout angle changes and what those changes might be associated with. In this example, what we notice is that the breakout angle rotates back and forth. The change from one breakout section to the next is small, usually around 10 degrees, but we see it changing back and forth by around 30 degrees. The most noticeable pattern in this data is that the breakout angle changes whenever the structure density increases. We are back to this problem of figuring out whether the stress tensor is rotating because of the ground conditions, or the ground conditions just bias the breakout angle while the stresses stay the same. We don't consistently have foliated ground, but there is some indication that the rock mass structure can locally affect the results. We didn't have much luck comparing the changes in breakout angle to lithology contexts or structures logged by our geologists. Sometimes there would be no structure that might obviously cause a rotation in the hole, but a nearby hole might have intersected a large shear zone which might explain the rotations of the holes around it. It is also difficult to interpret the changes when there were large sections of the hole without breakouts because we could not tell if anything was changing. Also, we were often unable to survey close to the bottoms of the holes where the most structures were because the old holes get filled with drill cuttings. In this hole we see much larger scale variations. There is not as much jointing in this hole, but we see the breakout angle slowly rotate 90 degrees over 300 feet at the beginning of the hole and then suddenly rotate back. The ATV found a large open joint around 150 feet, but what is more interesting is that this hole and others we surveyed near it all intersect the SMC around 400 feet down hole, and all those holes have these types of rotations above the SMC and then relatively consistent breakout angles below it. So in this area we have a family of structures that probably cause some sort of large scale rotation in the stress tensor. The other interesting thing about this hole is that around 800 feet, we suddenly got inconsistent breakout angles without any geologic structures or change in lithology. But there was a sudden increase in the number of joints as the hole approaches the amalgamated break. The breakout angles are consistent above and below the 800 foot mark, but it seems that a sudden change in rock mass characteristics made things locally inconsistent. The ATV approach helps us collect a lot of data very efficiently, and we trust that the big picture of all the data together has produced a fairly well-constrained stress tensor. However, looking at the data closely highlights some interesting behavior which makes us want to be more critical of the results. Before I conclude, here are the reference materials in this presentation, and I would like to thank DGI Geoscience and Core Geosystems for their help with the borehole breakout study. Today we discussed the importance of understanding in situ stresses for Mikasa and initial attempts to measure them using overcoring. Recently, we decided to use a borehole breakout approach with an acoustic televiewer for a stress measurement program to verify the overcoring measurements. The resolved stress tensor was significantly different from what we believed it was based on the overcoring tests. The overcoring tests may have been outliers, but the structural complexity of the Kirkland core body leads us to believe that there is some larger scale variation throughout the camp. 
We saw evidence of this in the televiewer data by seeing how breakout angles change in the presence of major structures. However, we have to be mindful that not every change in breakout angle is a change in the stress tensor. Local rock mass structures such as joints or foliations can cause anisotropic strength, which buys the breakout orientation. We have some work to do verifying our stress tensor with numerical model calibration and underground observations, but we have a lot of confidence in the results of this program. Thank you.